Are there more parallels to Halloween 3 and its Irish folklore than meets the eye in Halloween Ends? Stick around and find out why Michael Myers and this mythological beast aren't that different. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of The Film Detective, where today I'll be reviewing Halloween Ends. Uh, before I get into my thoughts on this movie, don't forget to smash the thumbs up button, subscribe to my channel, leave a comment down below, let me know what you think, not just of my review, but what you thought of the movie. Uh, if you haven't noticed from my previous videos, I enjoy the back and forth, whether you agree with me or disagree with me, like as long as you kind of keep the comments above the belt, um, I, I'm down for it. So uh, let me know what you think down below. All right, enough of that. Let's uh, jump into this review by taking it from the top. So right off the bat, this movie alerts us that it's going to be different. The film does not open with its traditional ominous, you know, Carpenter-esque score. We see the Universal logo display itself, and then we hear, you know, uh, I think it's 94.9 WURG with Willie the Kid. Uh, but we see the Halloween Ends little title card, and it's written to resemble Halloween 3 Season of the Witch. And that should have totally been our sign that we were in for a wild ride. The movie opens up one year after the events of uh, 2018 and Kills. And we're introduced to Corey Cunningham, who was the last minute replacement babysitter to watch this kid named Jeremy. Corey's advised by Jeremy's mother that since the events of 2018, Jeremy has been having nightmares and hearing voices in his sleep. And I'd be lying if I said my brain didn't Im immediately think of Danny Strode from Curse of Michael Myers and think there was going to be some sort of tie in to that movie with this kid as they've done in several other movies uh, tying in, you know, previous uh, iterations. So needless to say, that didn't happen. But we got some cool little Easter eggs from 78 where Corey and Jeremy are watching John Carpenter's The Thing. Uh, which was similar to how Lori and uh, Tommy and Lindsay were watching uh, The Thing from Another World when she was babysitting. Despite the unexpected opening, I will say that I enjoyed what they did, um, albeit seeing a kid fall three stories to his death really isn't my thing. But they established a lot of tension and suspense uh, in the moments leading up to the accident, which ultimately made it look like Corey murdered the kid. I know that we kind of had that given to us or leaked to us uh, prior to this movie's release, but they still did a good job with it. And the shot of that kid hitting the ground and his body and head snapping back was like, it was shocking. I actually did like, I was like, oh fuck in the theater. Uh, but the, the shock value definitely set a tone. This movie wasn't playing around. I've got to admit every movie in this trilogy has impressed me with their opening scenes. You know, how they finish, that's a different story. But, you know, after we get, you know, after the accident, we get a pretty cool uh, pumpkin splitting outro to the movie's opening. Uh, and we get the voiceover of uh, Laurie Strode recapping the 40 plus years of havoc Michael's plagued the town of Haddonfield with equipped with flashback scenes. I was sitting in my seat thinking, oh, no, like, here we go again with all the exposition, you know, as if we didn't get enough of that in Halloween Kills. But what we learn is these are the readings of Lori's memoirs, you know, which suddenly made me made it sit well with me. I've got to say when uh, referring to his disappearance, the line where she says truth would evolve into legend as people search for motive and meaning, looking into the shadows for their boogeyman. I got goosebumps like I really, really dug it. I mean, my only knock on the scene was, you know, we learned that Myers house was destroyed from a newspaper clip rather than like you're doing a montage of like flashbacks. Like we could have seen the townspeople burning it down or bulldozing it. You know, something could have been shown in that little flashback scene but basically what we learn in the events after the shapes uh shapes disappearance Haddonfield was no better off anytime tragedy struck the looming feeling of was this the boogeyman would strike the you know community to their core we see uh there's several different crime scenes one where there's a couple in in a jeep that had been shot to death and somebody i don't know if it was an officer or a deputy asked 
Hawkins, because he's now obviously a detective, if he's come back. And of course, Hawkins explains Michael doesn't use guns. But we even see Oscar's mother, she had hung herself outside of her house from, I guess we can assume it's from the grief and depression that affected her after her son's murder. But she's also wearing the same costume he was wearing that day, um, which, you know, I mean, an odd choice, but I could understand why people would think maybe, you know, something more nefarious happened uh, because generally people don't hang themselves out, hang themselves out in public. But Lori describes the suffering Michael's caused Haddonfield as an infection that's passing on people who have never even crossed his path. And infection becomes a key word in this film, and it's brought up several times that we'll kind of hit on as we, as we move along through this breakdown. But despite everything, Lori has proclaimed to not let fear rule her life anymore. This was a step in the right direction, I think, with her character. It made it her more palatable again for me. So we pick up after the events of 2018 and Kills, and we see that Lori and Allison are living together. Um, and Lori's turned over a new stone. She is the more of the 78 Lori than she was the 2018 Lori, although she still has that side in her because we see it when she burns her pumpkin pie. Corey's gone to work for his dad at his, uh, or his, his stepdad at his stepdad's junkyard, and he's a mechanic there. And that's where we start seeing parallels to Christine's kick in. But after work, Corey's uh, stepdad gifts him a motorcycle. It's not operable at the moment, so Corey hops on his bike and starts riding to the gas station. In between those scenes, we see a homeless man in what appears to be a dried out river or creek and collecting cans. And I'm not gonna lie, at first I thought that was Nick Castle. But the song that he's singing is pretty interesting and it's something I'm gonna focus on shortly. But as Corey arrives at the gas station, that homeless man really fixates on him. And I'm like, is it because he's he's the kid murderer, according to the town? Or what, you know, why is he focusing on him? But it's here we see how Corey worked his way in with Lori and then eventually Allison. Essentially, Lori intervened when these uh, little punk ass kids start fucking with him outside of uh, a gas station for not buying him beer. And because he's, you know, because he is the kid killer, they start giving him shit. And, and then he gets pushed, and when he falls down, he slices his hand on the glass of chocolate milk that he was holding onto. And I, I did like the scene where Lori flips open her knife and is like, who's doing the honors? Is it you or me? Like, she was kind of teaching Corey it's okay to... Street justice is not necessarily a bad uh, path to travel sometimes. Lori takes Corey to the hospital to get his hand stitched up, and it appeared that she had another motive, which was to try to set Allison up with a nice guy. It's not really hit on as far as like her past dating life after Halloween 2018 and Halloween Kills, but we do get a quick glimpse of the deputy that pulled her over was obviously a former love interest, and he was just a total douchebag. Maybe she just had a run of bad luck, I guess, and Lori was just trying to find her somebody she thought was a nice guy. And I really wanted to enjoy Allison in this movie. They almost wrote her, like, not perfect, but they, they, they almost had her right. Uh, with the exception, she was just a tad too, all the youngsters say, thirsty. Right, and almost like all of her intelligence went out the window. With Corey, it was love at first sight and it didn't quite land that way. But then again, like I said, I don't really know what her past was like after 2018, you know, after Cameron was killed and whatnot. I know there's there are women out there that play fast and loose, but this just was felt out of character for her. Um, or at least like there was no buildup to let the audience know that she went from Thelma to Daphne from Scooby-Doo like it just I don't know it just I didn't really like that and I'll get more into what I didn't like as we progress through this uh, breakdown and review we see an awkward exchange between Hawkins and Lori at the supermarket and and I thought it was cute I thought it reminded me a lot of back when I was in elementary school and I was talking to my crush on the playground but Lori leaves the store smiling from ear to ear, but it quickly gets shit on by this just awful human being who basically blames her for Michael's reign of terror on Haddonfield and more specifically blames her for the attack that happened to her sister 
that resulted in her sister's husband dying and her sister losing her voice. That's when we see that Sandra survived Halloween Kills, which is surprising because she had a fluorescent bulb shoved through her jugular. But I don't know, that reveal just felt meh for me. And if there's anything we've learned from David Gordon Green's uh, Halloween trilogy, if you get stabbed in the neck, you're going to live. If you get your throat slashed, you're not going to live. But anyways, that could have still taken place had Sandra died because the purpose was just to show that Lori, anywhere she goes, the horror of Michael follows her as if it was her fault. So after Corey gets his hand stitched up, Allison asks him out and he stupidly says no, but then later comes around and says yes. So he totally redeemed himself. Uh, he and Allison go to a bar that I believe is owned by Lindsay, but she could just be a bartender. It's never really ironed out. And we finally get to see what Nick Castle's role is in this film. And even though it's a funny callback to 78 where he flashes Corey and he says, you see anything you like, I think it was a disappointing use of someone so loved by the fans. Honestly, I think the Vagabond would have been a better role. I feel like that was just, he was underutilized and I, I didn't like that. Uh, but Corey and Allison are partying their asses off and there's an alcohol fueled montage that we get where Corey eventually loosens up and he's on the floor flopping around like a fish out of water and Allison's, you know, standing over the top of him casting spells. But uh, eventually Corey gets up and goes to get another beer. When he gets to the bar, he gets confronted by the mother of Jeremy who appears to be coping with her loss by diving into a bottle. If you notice, Jeremy's mother's hair and blouse are identical to they were in the opening scene. Um, it's so this was either a rush job thinking we wouldn't notice or every Halloween since her child's death, she decides to do her hair the same and wear the same outfit. She begins to accuse Corey of killing her son because he lost his mind. Ironically, Corey is wearing a scarecrow mask. And if we think back to Wizard of Oz, what did the scarecrow want? If I only had a brain. One thing of note regarding the scenes in the bar, Corey does not remove his scarecrow mask with the exception of when him and Allison are in the photo booth. More than likely, it's because he's afraid to show his face in public just because of the negativity that follows him around everywhere that he goes. But it's eerily similar to how Michael prefers to operate, which is with a mask. Perhaps that was some light foreshadowing of things to come. Corey eventually says, fuck it after Debbie Downer at the bar decided to cock block all the progress he was making with Allison, but despite his abrupt exit, Allison runs after him and tries to convince him to stay. Corey explains to her that everybody sees her as a survivor and him as a monster. Then he tells Allison that she can't fix him, which guys don't ever tell a lady that they can't fix you. But anyways, Corey bounces out. He just starts walking. I'm assuming he's going home. But as he's uh, crossing the bridge, he gets tracked down by the uh, bully bandos. And Terry, who is the lead shithead of that group, says, hey, let's shake hands. Let's call, let bygones be guy bygones. But we knew what he was up to and, and eventually a scuffle ensues. Corey pulls the knife Lori gave him earlier in the movie. He pulls it out to let them know that he's not fucking around. But fucking Dollar Tree Morgan Wallen disarms him with a drumstick and a flick of the wrist, which sends the knife flying off the bridge. And I just thought, I, I was like, man, I hope that he gets this, this guy back. One, his haircut is stupid. And two, I just, everything about that kid I dislike. I think what would have made more sense in this scene though, would have been if Corey initially got the better of the two male bullies and while standing over one of them, he had a knife to their throat, but he hesitates to stab the guy. And when he does, Terry grabs him from behind and tosses him over the bridge. I think that would have made the, um, and we'll get to it later, the teach me how to do it line that he tells Michael in the sewers make a lot more sense. It was like the hesitation got him fucked up. And now he's like, he's past the point of no return. And he wants to know, he wants to see that it's okay to, to, to cross that line. But needless to say, Terry gives uh, Corey the Royal Rumble treatment and the kids stare at his lifeless body as he, they leave him for dead at the uh, bottom of that dried up river. So here's where I want to park for a few minutes. When Corey gets confronted, we can see in the background, the missing persons billboard with Megan Baxter listed on it. And she was last seen on the exact same day just one year prior. 
Ironically, I think the placement of this billboard is exactly where she disappeared. Maybe Megan was lured underneath the bridge by Vagabond, asking her for help, only for Michael to pop out and drag her into the sewer. Obviously, Michael's ability to coexist with Vagabond is rather significant, so my guess is either he assists him in bringing down people to that area for Michael to make disappear, or maybe Michael's just grown so accustomed to living with crazy people after all those years at Smith's Grove, because let's face it, that Vagabond dude is nuts. Uh, he just leaves him be. Either way, I think that's uh, rather interesting. But uh, we see the camera pan down to Corey laying there unconscious. And we can see to the right of the screen, the shape is lurking in the darkness. And the homeless guy is just off to the left, warming himself by the fire. Vagabond starts singing for the second time in this movie. There's a hole in the boat and it won't stay afloat. Ola feist in the sea, nail my hands to the door and my knees to the floor to stop the water till we reach the shore. So what does any of that mean? As I alluded to in the opening of this video, Olaf Eist is a sea serpent-like monster in Irish mythology and folklore. These monsters were believed to inhabit many lakes and rivers in Ireland, and there's a ton of legends of saints and heroes fighting them. Olaf Eist's name is from the Irish Gaelic word ol meaning great and feist meaning fabulous beast. People described them as a huge dragon, vast and strong. One could interpret Olaf Eist being Michael Myers in this case. In one story, the monster is, uh, has swallowed a drunken piper named O'Rourke. Uh, the piper is either unaware of this predicament or completely unperturbed and continues to play his bagpipe inside Olaf Eist's uh, stomach. The monster becomes so annoyed with O'Rourke's music that he coughs him up and spits him out. Now, unfortunately, I couldn't find any more to the story in regard to how this event may have or have not changed or work. But if there's one running theme to all three of these Halloween movies, it's to show people's different responses to trauma. But I think it's a total parallel to what we see, minus Corey obviously not playing a bagpipe. Michael dragging Corey into the sewer is the equivalent to Olaf Eist swallowing O'Rourke. Michael releasing his stranglehold on Corey, which frees him from the sewer, is like the beast spitting O'Rourke out of his belly. You know, speaking of which, again, that scene where Michael reaches out and grabs Corey by the neck was another blunder by the marketing team um, and a waste of a perfect jump scare. And nonetheless, as Michael holds Corey by his neck, we see what appears to be a power transfer between Michael and Corey, but I'm not so sure that's what's happening. I like to think that it was Corey was kind of just seeing his life flash before his eyes. But leave me a comment down, uh, down below. Let me know what you think. I, I've heard questions as to why Michael let Corey go. And the best answer I can give is I don't know, nor should I, do I hope that the writers give a specific answer? Uh, was his grand scheme to hope that when he frees Corey, he's going to lead him directly to Lori? That's pretty far-fetched. Um, but was Michael just too weak to get the job done? You know, as we see later in the film, that's, that's a good possibility. My point is, is not knowing is my favorite answer to pretty much any Michael Myers question. As Corey begins to exit through the tunnel, he stops and the camera starts to, to tilt. It's symbolizing the turn is, is starting in Corey. Vagabond provides us with a nice jump scare and tells Corey that the man in there takes people in now and then and then asks why he let Corey live. I think this would have been the best role for Nick Castle. I don't know why it didn't work out that way, but it's because the man tells him to go back in there and get him that mask and then proclaims himself to actually be Michael Myers. So it's just like, dude, this was such a missed opportunity. It makes me crazy. And, and honestly, as if enough people weren't out to get Corey, Vagabond then pulls a knife on him. And Corey and, and him get into a tussle. Corey eventually stabs him in the stomach, which kills him. And whether that was intentional or not, the wheels are now in motion for Corey to turn from nerdy engineer who takes shit from absolutely everyone to serial killer in training. I mean, once he gets home and goes into the bathroom and looks at himself in the mirror, I got total Tobey Maguire post-radioactive spider bite vibes. I mean, you can see when he looks at himself in the mirror, he is not recognizing the person in, in the reflection. 
Now we go back to Lori is writing her memoirs and she hears a motorcycle approaching. And as she looks out her window, we see another homage to Halloween 1978. But instead of the boogeyman standing off to the side of a large bush, we see Corey. Lori walks out front to try to contact Corey, but he has disappeared, uh, eventually popping up behind her, which startles her. Corey's there to talk to Allison, basically wants to apologize for leaving her hanging uh, the night before. Corey asks Allison if they could go for a walk, and during their walk, he flat out just tells her, I killed someone. Allison doesn't ask any questions. She, I think she's just assuming that he's referring to Jeremy, um, but she doesn't, there's no follow-up questions. She just accepts it. Corey then takes her to the scene of the accident, the Allen's residence, and man, did that scene really tug at my heartstrings. Corey's on his knees right where Jeremy's body laid, and he's saying, I just wanted for us to have a fun night. That's all, just a good night. And then it all went bad. And he's just staring at the blood-stained wood. Man, I just, I, fe I actually felt awful in that moment. Like, it really got to me. And so I'm really impressed with that actor. So after they, they leave the Allen residence, they go to a diner and they sit down and, and share a few beers. And Allison tells Corey that the reason she never left Haddonfield was because all of her memories are here. And Corey just lays it onto her bluntly and tells her flat out, Lori feels guilty about killing your parents. So she's made you her child. And in turn, it prevents you from wanting to leave because you feel like you need to try to prevent Lori from reverting back to her old self. As they're having their discussion, they get interrupt interrupted by the uh, D-bag ex-boyfriend, Deputy Mulaney. And uh, as cordial as he tries to come off, he's totally trying to mark his territory in front of Corey. And Corey's just not taking his shit. They leave the restaurant and Corey drops Allison off at home. And it's obvious that he knows he's being followed by Mulaney and plans on taking care of the problem. I mean, he turned down pulling an all-nighter with Allison. So, you know, he's serious about you know, taking care of that clown. So between that scene where Corey's giving her a ride home on his motorcycle and this next scene where we see the unlikely team up between Corey and Michael, um, that's where I, I, I saw the uh, My Bodyguard influence that David Gordon Green said this movie would have. But I mean, since we're here, what was that? Corey baits Doug Mullaney into the sewers only to have Michael take him out, which that's not really my problem. But when the fight starts, we see Michael is weak and OK, I'm not thrilled with that decision, but but fine. And Corey assists him. Corey clubs uh, Mullaney over the head and, and kind of helps Michael get back up and start taking care of him. But it's the scene where he looks at him and he says, show me how to do it. Teach me. This is where I feel like there was that missed opportunity back on the bridge. They could have had it, like I said, where, where Corey was well within his right to defend himself against uh, the bullies. But he just, there was too much of a conscience still that he wasn't ready to cross that line. And in the process, it ended up getting him hurt, getting him thrown over the bridge. Well, Corey has now decided in his head that he wants to cross that line. He wants to be able to do that, but he just needs somebody to show him. So I feel like it would have sat better with me um, had they done that earlier in the movie for him to be asking Michael for help like this. But needless to say, Corey holds Mulaney's arms behind him and Michael slashes his throat and then stabs him. And I'm just like, holy crap, I'm actually watching somebody assist Michael, not Cult of Thorn assist Michael. Like I'm watching somebody hold a person for him to kill. And I was just like, this is, 2022 is like, is the weirdest year ever. But I spoke too soon because after Michael kills uh, Doug Mullaney, he, 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 it looks like he's having an orgasm. And it's either that or uh, Shang Sun is off screen and he's uh, sucking his soul from his body. Either way, like since we had already gone this far, like I wish this would be the only time it would be acceptable for Michael not to have his mask because I would have loved to have seen Michael's O face. Things go well, I might be showing her my O face. Oh, 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 you know what I'm talking about. Oh. <laughs> 
getting this review back on track, the CGI knife used in that scene was glaringly bad. I don't know how that happened, but it was obvious in the theater and it was obvious here at the house watching it on um, on my TV. The other thing that this scene led me to believe was going to start happening was I thought we were going to get some Hell Hellraiser 87 injected into here. I thought Corey was going to instigate problems with people who have tormented him since the accident with Jeremy, which was going to lead to a chase down into the sewer and Michael was going to take care of him until Corey got that confidence to start doing it himself. Well, obviously I was wrong, but I, since we had already gone this far in the movie, I felt like I could see them doing that. And I think I would have been okay with it because Michael would have had a higher body count than what we end up getting ultimately. One of my favorite scenes in this movie is when Lori's at the bar venting to Lindsay about how she sees Michael's eyes in Corey. And at the time, it just so happens that Roger Allen, the, the father of Jeremy, was there. And Lindsay wants Lori to go talk to him about Corey. But that's not really what I'm referring to as the conversation about Corey. It was something more subtle. David Gordon Green got hammered by a lot of people, myself included, for his overbearing approach to social commentary and Halloween kills. Evil dies tonight and the mob mentality was handled so poorly in that movie. You know, one could argue that it was written and directed by the fourth place winner of your local community college's student film contest. But in this movie, I saw growth, and maybe that's because they added two new writers to the story. But when Roger explains to Lori after the trial, he knew he'd never get closure for what happened to Jeremy that he would see how the people of Haddonfield would treat and avoid Corey when he was out in public for what happened. And it pissed him off because they were taking his pain and his despair and they were making it all about them. Now, I'm not gonna do, I'm not gonna smack you over the head with what that means or specific examples in our life where this shit happens. I believe we're all smarter than that. And we can all turn on the news and watch politicians, nonprofit groups, or just opportunists take advantage of someone's tragedy and make it their own, and a lot of times monetize it. So I'm giving them a clap right now. That was freaking beautiful. I loved it. It was subtle, but it was effective. But in that scene also, Roger does ask an important question, which is a question that we still don't know the answer to, which is, did the town do this to him? after the accident or was it always there and if i'm being honest i'm glad we never got an answer to that so we get to find out how allison's co-worker deb got her promotion and it's because she's obviously sleeping with dr mathis um, and although there were parts of this portion of the movie that i did like it it felt rushed and like there were some missed opportunities you know about 90 seconds after they walk through the door deb hears a crash and walks outside to see what happened and when she exits the house to the pool area, we can faintly see a silhouette of Corey in the background violently stabbing who we can assume is Dr. Mathis. And once she flips the lights on, we see that Corey's bagged him over the head and is cork stabbing the crap out of him. Deb panics and runs inside the house and slamming the sliding glass door on Corey's hand as he's trying to stop her from locking him out. And as she attempts to call 911, we see that shot that we got in the trailers where Michael slides the door open and eventually gives her the bob treatment by pinning her up against the wall. This scene was obviously a nod to both uh, 78 and 2018. And I'm just going to say it, it was a missed opportunity. They could have had a great cat and mouse style chase scene with Deb trying to navigate her way through the house to get out to her car or Dr. Mathis's car. Uh, but she's got, she's got Michael to worry about on the inside and Corey to worry about on the outside. There could have been so much tension, suspense, whatever you want to call it, and actually making this movie scary. That's the one thing that this movie didn't really do for me was it was never scary. And I think that would have been a perfect opportunity for them to take advantage of that moment and they didn't but then again we did get michael pinning someone up against the wall and that's a pretty nice consolation prize if you ask me 
The one thing I could have done without more than anything in this uh, portion of the movie was when Michael was killing Deb, Corey starts looking at his hand as if, you know, he's feeling the power as Michael kills her. Um, and then he places it on the window and Michael starts looking at him or kind of just like tilts his head and looks his direction. It didn't do anything for me in the sense of making me go like, oh my gosh, like it's the power transfer or they're, they're feeding off of each other. All it made me do was think of the cable guy. Come on, touch it. Looking back throughout this, uh, everything that's transpired in this movie, infection's a key word and it's used several times. But at this point, I genuinely believe Corey feels nothing, kind of like how Loomis described Michael in 78. Except for his infected hand that got smashed in the door, I, I believe he's feeling that. Maybe he's become so delusional that the pain that he's feeling, he's mistaking for the evil energy that Michael is giving him. Like, he thinks that, oh, what I'm feeling right now is, is coming from Michael. Shortly after killing Allison's boss and co-worker, Corey and Allison go to the top of the radio station where Allison confirms that Corey's hand is infected both the physical and metaphorical sign that Corey's turned evil. Corey explains that the roof of the radio station was the place he would hide out after Jeremy's death. He stated he would stare at the radio tower as if it were summoning him, like a watchtower or beacon calling him to live his old life, to be happy again. When I was watching this scene, I was just like, oh my God, they better not be insinuating that this is what Michael was doing all those times he was staring at the window at the radio tower. That would have been a huge mistake, but thankfully that's not what they did. Corey hops off the roof of the radio station and takes a minor spill, and then he sits up like Michael does, and I actually liked that. I thought that was pretty cool. But we finally get to put a face to the name of the radio station we've heard throughout this movie, and let me just say really quick, Willie the Kid's a fucking dick. Thankfully, he gets his comeuppance later in the film. Um, but as he completely insults both Corey and Allison, he walks inside the radio station and like immediately afterwards, Allison is like, let's run away together. Corey goes home and I guess he tells his parents his plan to leave and his mother, who's like the most vile, jealous, see you next Tuesday, uh, slaps him and then kisses him on the mouth. Very odd choice. I don't know whose decision that was, but it's low hanging fruit to poke fun at it. So I'm just going to move on. As if I couldn't like a character anymore, Corey's stepfather tells him, I hope you find love. We all need a Ronald figure in our life. The next thing we get is a title card that reads October 31st, which signifies the third act is officially underway. Since Corey's been kicked out of his parents' house, he chooses to sleep on the blood-stained wood floor inside the Allens' residence. When he wakes up, Lori's waiting for him holding the same style paper airplane Jeremy was asking Corey to help him make at the movie's opening. Lori explains to him that there are two kinds of evil. There's the evil that exists as an external force and threatens the well-being of the tribe. For sure, she's talking about Michael. The other kind of evil lives inside of us, like a sickness or an infection. There's that word again, and obviously she's talking about Corey. But when she goes on to tell him it's more dangerous because we may not know that we are infected, I was like, you know what? That's true, because throughout this movie, there's several times where Corey says, I don't know what's happening to me. You know, he's confused. But despite her telling Corey she wants to help him, she flat out just lays it out there and says, you can't have Allison. Corey's not happy and begins yelling at Lori because she's the one who brought him into the situation and now is trying to give him the boot. He tells Lori, if I can't have her, no one will. I, I really like this scene and I got the vibes from the movie Fear with Mark Wahlberg. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but um, basically he's an obsessed psycho boyfriend. Uh, but when, you know, when he's talking to her, he's kind of looking off to the side. When he looks up, Lori's vanished. And I, I believe that this was a hallucination. I think it's a combination of the infected hand um, as well as just kind of, you know, the metaphorical infection he's been undergoing that's kind of pushed him past this point of no return. Corey calls Allison and tells her they need to get the hell out of Dodge because Lori wants to kill him. Little did we know that this was part of a bigger plan of Corey's. 
So now we get to the most disappointing scene in a Halloween movie since Busta Rhymes went Liu Kang on Michael Myers in Resurrection. Corey rides his motorcycle to the sewer and bum rushes Michael, and I get it, he's lost complete control, but what the actual fuck did I see? Michael holds his own for about 15 seconds before Corey manhandles him, and not only steals his mask, but tells him he's nothing more than a man in a Halloween mask. How does nobody see this as a total kick in the dick to the legacy of Michael? How do you write those words on a script and not immediately delete them? For the defenders of the scene, I want to pose this scenario to you. There's a population of people both currently and in the future who have heard or will have heard of the legend of Michael Myers, but this may be the first film that they ever see. I think of my son specifically. He has never seen a Halloween movie, but re he recognizes him when he's in my man cave or when we're at a store that sells his merchandise. He and his friends talk about how scary they've heard he is. Now picture this being their first movie they see him in. Would I or anyone else they heard sing the Boogeyman's praises not immediately be discredited on the spot? It's not an issue to like this movie, but to flat out defend this decision is a head scratcher. Rarely will I ever tell anyone how to think, but nobody should defend this scene. I'm sorry. Corey off-screen stalks the bully bandos and follows them to the same gas station they had their first altercation at. Corey keys the word psycho onto the hood of Terry's convertible, which I believe was um, the car and the act of scratching up the car was a nod to Halloween 5. The band of misfits chase Corey to his stepfather's junkyard, where he proceeds to lock them in and pick them off one by one. Billy from New Kids on the Block being the first one to go by getting his stupid drumstick shoved through his eye. I freaking loved that. Another callback to Halloween 5 was when Corey chases and mows down Margo with the tow truck. A similar shot to when the shape chases Tina in uh, her boyfriend's car. And being the good friend that Terry is, he runs to Ronald's office and interrupts him watching a Van Damme flick uh, begging for help. Ronald gives Terry a lever action rifle and tells him to stay put, but of course, Terry does his own thing and the dumbass accidentally kills Ronald while trying to shoot Corey. He was dead nuts on that shot though, I'm not gonna lie. Why the fuck is Corey palming this mask like it's a basketball? Anybody, please let me know. Terry runs up to check on his friends and to check on the damage he's done to Ronald and Margot delivers a great line. She asks Terry where Stacy is and he says she's dead. Margot, trapped under the fence, tells Carrie, you're dead too. I freaking loved that. That was brilliant. After Corey cracks him with the stock of the rifle, he sparks a torch and mercilessly sears Terry's open mouth. It was a fantastic kill, don't get me wrong, but I feel like they dropped the ball by most of this shot being off screen or out of focus. Christopher Nelson and his crew have been nothing short of amazing during this trilogy and they should have let their work shine. Corey returns home and we see a POV shot of him grabbing a kitchen knife similar to 78 before taking out on what I assume to be years of frustration and abuse by his mother. The only problem is we saw none of it. I mean, we saw the stills and those uh, releases before the movie, but we don't even get to see the aftermath. It just cuts away and that's the end of it. Corey then drives to the radio station after getting a quick glimpse of Darcy the mail girl from um, the last drive-in. We cut to Willie the kid dancing to Teenage Werewolf. We can see in the background Corey is killing Darcy, but apparently that scene was left on the cutting room floor. Corey enters Willie's booth and gives us the best kill of the film. I absolutely loved when he pulled Willie's head up and after that final face match, we just see that tooth fall right out of his mouth and then he cuts off his tongue. As the record spins, his tongue is causing the uh, needle to skip, which is very creative and well executed. That was a A plus on that, that scene right there. So Allison goes to the diner and sees that Corey's not there and despite all of her efforts, she's not able to get a hold of him. This is where uh, I realized that, okay, Corey's plan isn't to just run away with Allison. His plan is to get her out of the house so he can kill Lori before running away with Allison. Uh, we finally get to see the outcome from that scene in the uh, teaser trailer that had everybody going nuts. Lori is depressed because Allison has left and she falls off the wagon. She grabs her revolver out of the safe and calls 911 to report that there's been a suicide. Technically, she was correct. 
As we see the hand open the door, a gunshot goes off and what appears to be brain matter flies against the wall. Corey's hand continues to push the door open and we find that Lori has not shot herself, she shot a pumpkin. Uh, she tells Corey, did you really think I'd kill myself? Then shoots him twice in the upper body, causing him to crash through the banister and fall to the first floor. Corey got a little bit of a taste of his own medicine, so to speak, with uh, what Jeremy experienced in the beginning. Lori cracks off all her rounds and then challenges Corey to kill her. Just then, Corey hears the rattling of Allison's car and begins to laugh. His plan has been foiled. She wasn't supposed to be there, so he resorts to his backup plan, which is to kill himself and make it look like Lori did it. Great fucking plan B, bro. He tells Lori, if I can't have her, then jabs the knife into his throat. And if that wasn't bad enough, Allison walks into the house and sees Lori standing over the three-day-old love of her life, holding a bloody kitchen knife, and completely loses her shit, thinking Lori killed him. Again, this is why I did not like how they wrote Allison, because they made her a total dummy in this film. I mean, let's just look at the evidence in the surrounding area. One, why is your boyfriend at your house when he's supposed to be meeting you at 9 o'clock? Two, why is he in coveralls when he's not been at work? And three, probably the biggest one of all, why the fuck is there a Michael Myers mask laying next to his body? Apparently, self-defense never crossed her mind because the writing of Corey fucked around and found out is all over the wall. I mean, in all honesty, I was mostly on board with this movie, but the character we've followed for 95% of this film, at least to this point, just had the most unceremonious death. If you boil down his character's trajectory, at least to its simplest form, he was the reason for Michael to leave the sewer retrieve his mask and have his final showdown with Lori. Allison leaves the house and Lori is again left alone, sort of. Lori's sitting down, pressed up against the wall in her kitchen. Just her head is probably spinning with all the shit that's happened. She hears footsteps and then we see Michael's hand reach down and pick up the mask. And as he does that, Corey gives Michael his one last scare. And I don't know if that was intentional or if that was just coincidental, but either way, I that's how I interpreted it. And I actually really thought that was that was cool to see Michael get a taste of his own medicine. Other than that, I don't really have a lot to say about the final showdown between Michael and Lori. I mean, the trailers showed us most of it, and I still can't figure out the disconnect between the marketing teams and these movie studios and why the movie studios stand for this or maybe they're just complicit you know maybe it's they literally just feel like they don't think there's a lot of quality in the movie so they're just like just show them everything and maybe that'll be enough to get asses in seats but you know i'm not i'm not happy that michael died i wanted him to live and Lori to die but uh, i am satisfied that they made a decision in the end and only one walked away from it because i felt like if they killed them both off and i thought when michael ripped his hand off the knife and grabbed Lori around the throat i thought that might be it you know thankfully allison turned around and once she saw the radio tower was on fire and came back and and saved Lori's life <laughs> yeah the ending was uh the the final fight was just kind of not that great it was it was rather um disappointing now that michael is dead the plan is to dispose of his body in the car crusher at ronald's junkyard so what they do is they strap him to the roof of Allison's car like he's fucking Granny from the Beverly Hillbillies. Watch your hair, Granny. Apparently, nobody needs to worry about the preservation of evidence from the homicide scene at the junkyard because the entire town just walks right in. We see shots of characters that survived attacks from Michael Myers in this trilogy, with the exception of Lindsay, which is a pretty big miss. And I'm not sure if that was a scheduling conflict or if that was just a um, oversight. Uh, but how does that happen? I mean, she was an integral part to Halloween Kills and the history, you know, going back to 78. And you guys forgot her. That's kind of a big whoops. 
But the once angry mob of Haddonfield citizens all shuffle into the junkyard and then they crowd surf Michael's lifeless body towards the car crusher. With as off the wall as this third act got, I really thought he might reach up and pull Lori in with him at the very end. But he doesn't, and we see Allison flip the switch only for Michael to be turned into minced meat. Lori finally gets the closure that she was looking for, and Allison pulled the trigger and left Haddonfield. Hawkins, which was another wasted character in this trilogy, shows up to thank Lori for killing the boogeyman with a basket full of vegetables. That was a callback to the conversation that they had at the grocery store. I'd like to think since they're going with the happily ever after ending that uh, Hawkins and Lori rekindle their old fling and live happily ever after. So I know what you're thinking. I'm about to eviscerate this movie on my report card, but hang in there and, and don't judge a book by its cover. Actually, before we get into the report card, let me cover a few more likes and dislikes from this movie. I always want to end on a positive note, so let's go over my dislikes first. One, this movie lacked tension. Uh, it started out pretty good, but overall it did not meet my expectations for what a Halloween film should have, especially when you look at the original and how well they did it. I felt like Hawkins and Lindsay were totally wasted in this movie. We spent so much time on their backstory, Hawkins going back to 2018, and there was zero payoff. Michael having roughly 10 minutes of screen time was a major letdown. And yes, I have seen the tweet that technically he was in this movie more than Michael was in 78. But if you subtract the time spent tied to the roof of Allison's car and crowd surfing, I bet that would change the number. And not to mention, it's about quality over quantity anyways. And I would love for anyone to tell me that Michael's screen time in ends was more valuable than it was in 78. So talking about the trailers again, um, if I were the mayor of Hollywood, that marketing team would never work in the business again, especially if they it was the same marketing team as Halloween Kills. Like seriously, this is two movies in a row. They totally destroyed these movies by oversharing and it's just, it's, it's mind numbingly frustrating. The cutaways from several kills or just flat out not showing them was frustrating. Not to mention Corey tripling Michael's body count, I was not a fan of that choice. This movie was marketed to like the equivalent to the Thrilla in Manila between Michael and Lori, but this movie played out like Tyson vs. Holyfield where Tyson got DQ'd for biting his ear off. I talked about this very thing on one of my buddy's channels, which I called it the kiss of death for some of these directors who are, they get creative control over these iconic horror franchises. And they make one or two films that are just doing nothing but paying homage to the classics. And then by the third film, they try to put their own stamp on it. And you've lost a majority of the audience because the story is no longer cohesive to what you're putting out. And this is a prime example of that. I'm hoping this is a lesson for David Gordon Green with The Exorcist on deck for him. With all that being said, the silver lining to this trilogy is there so many other timelines in this franchise you can essentially choose your own spooky adventure me i i'll hit 2018 for sure that's my favorite of david gordon green's movies um but i don't know how much i will watch this all the way through so as for my likes uh, Christopher Nelson, he's a master of his craft and has been nothing short of spectacular to this franchise. Literally, like, I cannot think of one practical effect that he or his team did that just didn't work for me. This score might be my favorite of the trilogy and possibly the franchise. Uh, I ordered it, or I have it pre-ordered on vinyl, so once it comes in, I'm going to sit down and listen to all three of them that Carpenter... Um, his son Cody and Daniel Davies uh, did, and I'll probably put out a, a short video over which one I liked the best. I really liked the Corey character. I thought his story was well written up until the end. Uh, even though he was evil, I found myself conflicted and rooting for him quite a bit throughout the movie. Everybody that he killed was just not a likable person. So I don't know if that was intentional or they just didn't realize it, but like I was rooting for him most of the time. Rohan Campbell was a great addition to this movie and he actually made me feel what he was feeling during certain scenes in the movie. And that's saying something. 
I wish they brought his character in sooner. And is it just me? When I look at him, I think of like a younger William Defoe. Let me know in the comments down below. I know I mentioned this earlier, but the dialogue was a massive step up from Halloween Kills for me. I don't know if that's saying a lot, but I thought this was actually really well written. They, like I said earlier, they seamlessly wove a social commentary into this story, which was far more effective than beating the audience over the head with it. I believe they learned their lesson from Kills, and that's why they brought in the two additional writers, and um, it paid off. And I think what David Gordon Green did with this movie is show that a season of the Witch Anthology series can work. I mean, it came at the price of pissing off a lot of fans, but had Kills been 30 minutes longer and Laurie and Michael had it out after Karen's death and the story, that story came to a conclusion, and then he did this story as his third Halloween movie, just minus Michael completely, this would have worked. And being a massive Season of the Witch fan, this movie makes me hopeful that we will see some sort of anthology series soon. So let's get down to brass tacks and talk about this movie's report card. Okay, so for those of you that are new to this channel, this is the chart that I use to calculate the film's GPA. And the film's GPA is based off of five categories, which are plot, dialogue, pacing and structure, cinematography, and entertainment value. Halloween Ends gets a D for the plot. I thought that it was a massive mistake to try and do this for your final film that was supposed to close out everything, right? The entire from 78 till now, this is how you decided to end it. I thought that was just a massive mistake. I thought that the marketing was incredibly deceptive because I think it, David Gordon Green was trying to give us all the warning signs. He kept, he was giving us too much information about how this was different and everything. I think he was trying to be honest with us. And I think the marketing team knew that if they were too honest or told us to expect the unexpected, it would have hurt the box office sales. So yeah, I, there's not much defending I can do. It's disappointing that they, this is how they closed it out, but let's just move on. Dialogue gets a B plus. It could have been that the last movie I watched prior to walking into this film was Halloween Kills, and it reminded me of how much I hated the dialogue, and this was a step in the, in the right direction. Was it that great? Maybe I was just blinded by how much I hated it from Halloween Kills. And if you want to know all my thoughts on Halloween Kills, you can go check out that review after this. Pacing and structure gets a C. This movie... Because I think it was such a deviation from Kills in 2018, there was a, a major main addition to this film. I felt like it was rushed, but not just because of Corey. I felt that it was rushed. There were scenes that I talked about in my breakdown review that missed opportunities, right? There were opportunities that they could have had a chase scene. They could have built more tension, dragged some of those scenes out we got no stalking scenes virtually in this movie they missed the mark on that and i felt like it was because they had to rush to get everything in to have this corey story pay off cinematography gets an a minus i thought this movie was really it looked good the shots were good the cg there was a, a few areas where cgi just wasn't quite there for me um and that's where i dinged it a bit but all three of these movies have had great cinematography. And for entertainment value, I give it a B. It's entertaining. Um, like I said, I was constantly guessing and kind of in shock, but I was entertained while I was watching this movie. I, I never found myself being bored, but I think the plot kind of things, how entertaining it actually was, especially the third act. Anyways, the overall GPA for Halloween Ends is 2.6, but there's a twist. I did a separate report card to view this movie as a standalone Halloween film, much like Season of the Witch. Not much changes with the exception of the plot. If this movie, if David Gordon Green had wrapped up his Myers Laurie Strode's story with Halloween Kills and then gave us this as the third movie, I would have given the plot a B. Everything else pretty much stays the same with the exception of the plot. The plot moves up to a B because this is, this would have been a great addition to a season of The Witch. And like I said in my likes, I feel like David Gordon Reed showed us 
that this could work. And I think we're gonna get something in the future. As a standalone movie that would fit in to a Halloween anthology series, I think this movie is a 3.0. So let me know what you think down below. Do you think I'm crazy with how I feel about this? I'm genuinely curious to see how everybody else feels out there. Last but certainly not least, don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already. Also, if you're looking for some pretty sweet swag, you can go check out my merch store over at Teespring. The link will be down in the description below. I want to thank you guys for tuning in and have a great day. See ya.